thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of serving Norma's family yesterday. Uh, I served Norma back in 2015 at her husband's funeral, and then I served uh, her yesterday, or her family yesterday, with her funeral. I wish I could have known Norma in a deeper sense, if you will, and uh, I look forward to the day that I will see her again. I thank you for the opportunity to do your calling on my life, Lord, and that calling is to share Jesus Christ with anyone and everyone I have the opportunity to share with in whatever ways you deem I should. So, Father, today I, I ask you to open up the hearts, minds, souls, and spirits of those who hear your words today, and may they receive the word as you would have it received. I ask you that you use me and use Deanne as your tool, as your vessel, to bring forth that word, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Let it resonate in the hearts and souls and spirits of all those who hear today, so that we will come to a better understanding of the love that you have for us, each of us, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen? Amen. Amen. First and foremost, happy Mother's Day to all you moms. Thank you. Now, if you're not a mom, happy Mother's Day to you anyway. Okay? Because I'm going to share with you today uh, what God has put on my heart uh, for you moms. Okay? And if you haven't had children, there's in certain ways you're still a mom, and I'll share that with you in a little while when we get through our teaching. Our teaching might be short today. I think uh, it's probably only about four hours long, so shouldn't be too bad. But we're going to start in Genesis 1, and certainly we're going to go to other scriptures. So if you go ahead and open up your Bibles to Genesis 1. <clears throat> I have shared this somewhat of this message to some degree before, and I think it's very, very appropriate and uh, I've always gotten a positive response, if you will, about it. Um, it's about moms. It's about moms being God's gift to each and every one of us. Our mothers, we of course would not be here without our moms, no doubt. But our moms are a special creation of God that lets us know and lets us hopefully realize just how much God loves us because the love that moms have for their children is an undying, uncompromising, always forgiving, always adoring love. Guys, we don't have that, okay? Our kids get out of line, we're ready to slap them on the back of the head. Okay, we're ready to snatch a knot in them. Okay, we know that. But we're called not to do that, but we're called to be governors of our family, governors of our children. We're also called to be protectors of our children. And so we have that inkling in us in order to, to overcome any adversity, if you will. Moms, on the other hand, are also called to discipline their children. But moms have a different way of doing it, no doubt, than what we do. Moms do it the way Jesus did it. They do it out of love, just pure love. And, and we do it out of love, but we do it in a way that the kids don't understand is love. Moms do it in a love the way they understand it is truly, truly love. We have hard love. You bet we do. We, uh, we want to get the message in there, right? First time, not second time, first time. Moms go on and on and on and on and on. How many times has my mom forgiven me? I could not count. I could not count. But she always forgave me. Dads, on the other hand, in my life, were not that kind of a forgiving being let's say 
But my mom always loved me. Until one of the last words that she told me when my son and I were with her uh, right before she passed, she couldn't say much of anything, but she got out, I love you. And that's, that's all I needed. Because I knew it was true. Even though my mom and I had some disagreements, boy, did we ever. I wonder whose fault that was. But we had some disagreements, strong disagreements from time to time. But I knew and always knew my mom loved me. And I told a buddy of mine who many of you know, Calvin, I call him Cool. I told Cool one day about a month and a half or so after my mom had passed, and I had the, uh, the privilege of doing her service in Georgia. But after she had passed, I told Calvin one day, I said, Cool, I miss my mom. I've never missed my dad, okay? I just haven't. Either one of them, stepdad or my dad. But I missed my mom, and my heart was empty because my mom wasn't available. It's that love that we understand as children. It's that love that we receive that lives in us. It, it's not dead. It lives in us. And hopefully at some point in time, even though you may have some disagreements with your mom, at some point in time, you will come to the realization of really and truly just how much your mom truly, truly, truly loves you. Now, many of your moms are gone. Some of your moms are here. Your mom is always available in your heart. She's always there. She's never gone. Just like God is never gone. She, he's never gone. He's always with you. Women are so much like God, it's to the point to where we sit back and we go, God, why can't we be more like her? Why can't we be more like ladies, you know, the women? It's because we're not made that way, guys. And Chris is going to talk about that on Father's Day. But we have to understand our mothers are the closest example on this earth of God's true love because they love us unconditionally the same way God loves us. The same way God loves us. Now again, you may have had some situations in your life with your mom to where you didn't always agree, let's just put it that way. But I'm going to use my mom as an example because I can. I can't use yours because you don't allow me to, but I can use mine, okay? My mom was single, worked three jobs, raised five kids by herself. Well, with the help of my 12-year-old sister at the time. Actually, 10 at the time. She did the best that she could with what she had. She was not perfect, but she did the best she could with what she had. But one thing we always knew is that she loved us. And irregardless of whether you get your way or not and feel as though, which is most people, and especially kids, well, if I don't get my way, you don't love me anymore. That is not true. Sometimes you don't get your way because God, um, your mom does love you. And that happened to me on more than one occasion. So I have to come to the realization that my mother was love. She was undying, always forgiving, never changing love, the best love that she could give me. And I cherish her for that. I do. But the Lord has given me a message today that I think and I hope you will understand why there is moms Chris will share with you why there are dads later on at Father's Day. If we look over in Genesis 1 and 27, we will see that so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So there are only two genders in life. And it is male and female. Now, if anybody else wants to do anything else, then they're going against God. 
There are only two, male and female. He created them. Then we look over at Genesis, and I'm going to skip around a little bit because I don't need to share this whole story with you, but over in Genesis 2, jump over to Genesis 2, verse 18. And this is after, after in verse 7, 2 and 7, where God created Adam, bringing us to 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good for man, at this time only Adam was created, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper, comparable, not a slave, a helper comparable to him. A helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave, ne gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the air, and to all the beasts of the field. But Adam, but for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. A helper comparable to him. <clears throat> And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall over Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Now, Adam thought, as he looked around and saw all the animals that he had named, and he saw that there was male and female in all the animal kingdoms, Adam looked around and said, God, what about me? And God said, well, you know what? That's a pretty tall order. It's probably going to cost you an arm and a leg. So Adam says, well, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> it's right here in Scripture. So God took the rib, which the Lord God had taken from the man, verse 22, and made, into, made it into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. When Adam first saw her, where did the name come from? Woman! Okay. Therefore, verse 24. A man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Very important. One flesh. They were two flesh, and now they are one flesh. They were two flesh, and now they are one flesh. And I'm going to explain that here in just a second. And they were both naked, and the man with his wife, and were not ashamed. Jump over to chapter 3, verse 16. Chapter 3, verse 16. I'm not going to go through the whole fall. We've heard that story before, right? The serpent, the fruit of the tree of knowledge. I shared all this last week. But in verse 16, because of the fall, because at, uh, Eve was deceived... Because she failed to follow the course God had laid out, if you will, because Adam had told her, you shall not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, of course, they knew evil. Uh, and because they had done what they had done, verse 16, to the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Now what is, and we're going to break these scriptures down right here. So what is the sorrow? The sorrow is how many ladies, if you will, this is not talking to men, how many ladies, if you will, have ever had your heart broken by your children? Every one of you, okay? How many times... Have you looked at your children and thought, if I could just save you, 
if I could just help you, if you will just listen, if I could just guide and direct you, if you will just, this is where it comes from, if you will just let me love you and help you through this, but yet the children do as they may, right? So those are the sorrows Christ is talking about. And then he says, and your conception, which simply means is you're going to have a bunch of kids that you're going to have to deal with throughout your life. Women deal with kids. I don't know how, but they do. They deal with them on a constant basis. They ha seem to have that, that ability to deal with these crazy, not-headed, rug-rat kids. Now, I love my kids. I do. I got five of them, seven counting Terry's. But they're still crazy, not-headed, rug-rat kids. Even as adults, it's like, my gosh, what are you thinking? But the wives, they said, yeah, but you know what? That's my kid. That's my kid. It doesn't matter what they do. That's why your heart gets trampled time and time and time again. It's because maybe you love too much, but you don't. You can't love too much. But this is what God is talking about. Your sorrow will be plentiful and your conception will be plentiful. Your heart is going to be stomped on numerous times. In pain you shall bring forth children. I don't know. I would not understand that whatsoever. How you women could go through that. Nine months of all that agony and pain and discomfort and on and on. And then when they lay that baby on your chest, you would say, I'll do it again. We don't get that, ladies. Guys don't get that. I had the opportunity of watching two of my children be born. One was cesarean, one was natural. Guarantee you, there would have been one and that's it. There ain't, there's no question whatsoever in my mind. But ladies sit there and say, I'll do it again. Wow, that's love. That's love. I'm going to jump over, you stay where you're at, but I'm going to jump over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, I didn't write this. God wrote this, okay? I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman, I didn't write it, is man. And the head of Christ is God. Now, the reason that I share that with you, look at the next line. And your desire, back over in uh, verse 16, chapter 3 of Genesis, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. This is God, not me, okay? This is God's word. Now, whenever we see this, your desire is for your husband, most w women think, oh, yeah, well, I love my husband, and I desire to be with him, and et cetera, et cetera. That's not what that scripture's talking about. I'm sorry. What that scripture is talking about, because this is the fall that we're dealing with, what that scripture is talking about is what a lot of you women say today. Well, I'm not following him. He's a knothead. I'm not following my husband. I'm not going to do what my husband says. I am my own person. And this is the enmity that God put between man and woman is, is that women are given, have given the power and the sense that they should rule themselves without a man. And many of you do it for just fine. But remember, God said it is not good for man to be alone, nor is it good for women to be alone. He was talking about mankind. So when he says that your husband is to rule over you, what he is simply talking about there is that the head of every man is God. This is kind of like, if you will, in the military term, it's kind of like a chain of command. But better yet to understand it properly it's a chain of responsibility. 
It's a chain of responsibility. God is going to hold me accountable for my wife's well-being, for her spiritual well-being, for her emotional well-being, for her financial well-being, for her any well-being that you want to call it. I am held responsible for my wife. Ephesians 5 tells us that we are present our wives as spotless and blameless unto the Lord. That means I am responsible for her. She is really responsible for my kids, but I am also responsible for my kids. Uh, anything God has given me, I am responsible for. To take it to a larger uh, uh, vision, if you will, everyone that comes to this church, that, that sits in this church and listens to a teaching that I am given, I am responsible for your spiritual well-being. I'm responsible for you understanding the scriptures. I'm not going to paint you a pretty picture because guess what? It's not a pretty picture until the end. I told you that a couple of weeks ago. We have troubles in this world. We have problems in this world. We are going to have to fight tooth and nail. We're going to be persecuted. But you will make it through if you are with God. And so my point is, is to try to teach you and to share with you the word of God so that you have confidence, confidence in God that he is going to see you through Ephesians 1, 6, that God will complete anything and everything that he has started in you. You say, well, I'm coming to church to see if I can become a Christian. No, God has already called you to church. You're, all, you're only here because he's called you. And he will complete what he has started in you. If you have faith in him. So we have to realize that God is not saying, guys, <laughs> if you go back to Ephesians 5 and 21 and 23 there, it says, uh, uh, wives obey your husband. And the women just don't like that. Women don't like that. I can understand why. It's because of the implications of the flesh. What that scripture is actually saying is, if your husband is a godly man, if your husband is a godly man, if, guys, you are doing what you are called to do and are supposed to be doing, your wife is to follow the ministry God has put on your heart. You say, well, I don't have a ministry. Yes, you do. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a minister. You're told, it is told to us that in Scripture, we're all ministers of the gospel. You have a ministry whether you think you do or not. And your wife is to come under your ministry and be a comparable helper, a paraclete, a helper, a help meet to help you with what God has put on your heart because you are responsible to God. Now, I'm getting over into the men thing here, but I just want you the ladies to understand, you are not a slave of your husband. It goes on to explain that if your husband does not follow God, you are to follow God and not your husband. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, guys. Seriously. If you're not doing your job, the lady is not to follow you. She is to follow God. If you don't like it, take it up with God. But that is how it is, friends. And you need to understand that. Why? Because whether you have accepted that responsibility or not, men, you will be held accountable. You will answer to God. Ladies, you will also answer to God. You will also answer to God. Because of the fall of mankind though both male and female have sinned and they pass that same sin sin nature if you will on to generation after generation after generation after generation we are all born sinful oh how can a baby be sinful well, the baby is. The baby, whenever that baby is born, there is one thing that baby thinks of, and that is me, 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 me. It is all about me. Change my diaper. Feed me. Uh, take care of me. Clothe me. Give me toys. I want to sleep. Let me sleep on it. Whatever. Now we say, 
Oh, but this is just a baby. They don't know any better. True, and that actually comes into play, believe it or not. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. But this sin is passed on from generation to generation to generation. And so, therefore, there is enmity between husband and wife. There is enmity between mother and child. There is enmity between father and child because of this sin nature that lives in us. And that is not how God had, had originally designed it. He designed it that we have a relationship with one another and we have a relationship with the Father. God is a plural God. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, is there not? Yes, there is. There is a relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and it is a perfect relationship. And if we are made in the image of God, then we are actually made to have that perfect image and that perfect relationship. However, we have failed to do so. Therefore, there is a fall. And we have to realize that. In Genesis 2 and 7, God made Adam... He made Adam and he made him complete. Eve wasn't made yet. He made Adam and he made Adam complete. But again, there's the relationship. If, God, if Adam is by himself, who is he having a relationship with? Other than God. But who is he having a relationship on this earth? There was no female at the time. There was no other male at the time. So Adam had no comparable helper. So God made Eve. Now when he caused Adam to go into this deep sleep and he removed a rib or whatever you want to call it, he removed that rib and made Eve and he brought him to Eve and he named her Eve because she is the mother of all. She is the first mother of everyone. <clears throat> so how did God... Create a perfect and complete Adam and create a perfect and complete Eve. If he had done that, why would they want to have a relationship with each other? Because they're complete, right? So what he did, now this is woodyology. This is not in scripture. But as I study through scripture, I truly, truly, truly believe this. And scripture shows it to me, but not in so many words. What God did was he called Adam to sleep and he took from Adam the feminine, if you will, attributes because Adam was complete. He was complete. But he took the female attributes, if you will, or aspects from Adam and put them in Eve. He took all the feminine qualities of a lady, if you will, from the complete man and put him in Eve. And now Eve has all the female qualities. Adam has all the male qualities. And the two shall come together and be one flesh. You see how it works? Man, it is not good for man to be alone. So we need our wives to be a part of us to complete us. Ladies, believe it or not, you need your husband to be a part of you, to make you complete. Now, you say, but my husband has passed. My husband left me. My wife has passed. My wife has left me. On and on and on, whatever you can come up with. God is always there. And God will fulfill that other role. You are never alone. Even when you're all by yourself, you're never alone because God is present. And God will fulfill that until he puts another person in your life, if he so deems it. If he so deems it. My mom lived a long time by herself. And she died by herself. And I mean without a husband. Yesterday, I did Norma Riggs' funeral. I did her husband's funeral. They were married 55 years. I did her husband's funeral in 2015. She lived roughly eight years without a husband. But she had God. Always had God. 
Never once did she not have God. So God fulfills whatever he needs to to make you complete. God took those qualities, those loving, totally forgiving, unchangeable qualities of a loving mother and put them in the female Eve. And only with that, only with that female, if you will, can we as men be complete in God's eyes. Now, again, guys, if you've lost your wife, if she's left you, if she's divorced you, whatever, if you're by yourself, God still loves you to the point to where he can fulfill all that is missing in your life. All that is missing in your life. Until he decides to put somebody else in your life, if he so deems. When we look at the female and her godly traits, they are completely different than that of man's because that's the way God designed it. The traits of a man is another teaching that Chris is going to share with us later on at Father's Day. So today, our, I want us to be fixed on moms or mothers and wives. Now guys, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but so I'll use me. I am a man of 66 years old. I've done a whole lot of stuff in my life. I've been overseas to war. I've worked all my life. I've provided on and on and on and on. I'm a man's man. I don't back down to any man. I don't cower to any man. I'm not afraid of any man. But when my wife puts that soft, tender hand in mine, it melts my heart. When my wife takes her gentle hand and caresses my cheek, it softens my heart. When my wife puts her loving arms around me, and lays her head on my chest, pressing into my heart. It melts my butter. Because that love that women have can take a man's man and bring him down almost to the point of a little child. That's how strong a lady's love is. It's the same love that God has for each of us. Jesus said, unless you become like one of these, speaking of little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So see, we need, guys, we need to let our pride go sometime and just learn to accept the love of our wives. Wives are very, very important. They make you complete in God's eyes. I always find comfort in the love of my wife that she has for me. And I try. I'm not perfect at it. And matter of fact, I'm probably not even very good at it. But I try to return that love if possible. If I recognize it. If I get rid of my pride. If I get rid of myself. I try to return that love. But it's never as strong as hers. The Bible speaks of every asset, aspect of motherhood that only women, only women have and only women can understand and only women can perceive. We, we see it, but we don't get it. We, don't, we can't get it. Only women can conceive a child. Only women can go through a pregnancy of a child. Only women can feel the pain of childbirth. Only women can nurse and nurture a child. And then after this, only women can give the love of God to a child 
that is far beyond what guys we can we can do. We can we don't have that. We don't have that quality of a loving mother, of a loving wife. We don't have that. We don't possess that. We can see it and we can simulate it and we can try to do it as best we can, but we're not the same as our wives and our mothers. Mothers are totally different from fathers. And yes, guys, we have these traits to some degree, but only because we have received them from our mothers. See, we don't know the mother's love until we have received it from a mother. This is the importance of our mothers in our lives. The traits are special. Their comfort, their compassion, their sorrow, there's forgiveness, and on and on and on. And to show us the riches, God has planned for motherhood. He used a human woman to bring his son into the earth. He used a woman. He, God could have just said, Jesus, go on down. Jesus was already existing. He was already there. He could have said, Jesus, drop down there and take care of business. But no, what he said is, is that over in Isaiah 7 and 14, and the virgin shall bear a son, and he shall be called the son of God. This giving of life that God has granted women, it bestows or it gives the greatest honor to you ladies that God could possibly give. To give life. Without the mothers, without our wives, without the ladies, as I said earlier, none of us would be here. You have been given the privilege to carry life, to grow life, and to give life. That's a godly trait because life only comes from God. Since I'm not a female, though I've watched two of my kids been bo being born, it is truly a miracle to witness that. It surpasses all other miracles, but I also think to mothers as well, how in the world can you go through all that you go through, have that child, have that child laid on your chest and say, yes, I'll do it again? That only comes from the love of a mother. Guys, we don't understand it. We don't get it. And we don't have to get it. But we do need to witness it. And we need to honor it. At that very moment, I would believe that you moms feel and felt as Mary did, the mother of Jesus. Over in Luke 1, Luke 1 and 46, it's called the Song of Mary. Luke 1 and 46, and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And holy is his name. This is how women in their, especially a spiritual woman, this is how a woman feels whenever they receive that baby on their chest. I am blessed. Now, they may not realize or even announce who it came from, but some point in time, they will realize that this is a miracle given by God. This baby that they have now, are now holding. Mary knew that. She was a young girl, probably around 15. And she said, blessed is the maidservant. She is the mother of all after Eve. 
She is the mother of all Christians because we look at her, ladies look at her to see what the mother should be and should feel like. Remember, that mother was kneeling at the cross at the foot of her son as his blood dripped down on her. And she was about to lose her begotten son of God. And Jesus looked down at her and loved her. And he said, woman, behold your son. To John, he said, behold your mother. Why? Because he never wanted her, his mother to be without his son. Now there are those, for some reason, that have either lost children in one way or another, and there are those that Scripture calls barren. Don't think for a moment that God is against you in any way, shape, form, or fashion. My mom, though she had five kids, she lost three kids. My mom is now with those three kids. To those who have lost their babies, once conceived, that baby is of God. Once conceived, not born. Once conceived, that baby is of God. Scripture doesn't plainly tell us this to the minute degree, if you will, but it does explain it to us over other scriptures and puts it all together for us. But there is one particular scripture that shares this with us. And if you were just to read it, you would probably read over this. So therefore, as I said earlier, my job is to get you to understand and see scripture. So let's go to Psalms 139. Psalms 139. My mom lost three kids. Many of you have lost kids in one way or another. You will see those children again someday. Psalms 139, verses 13 through 18. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, and I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wow. You covered me in my mother's womb. That means you were there with me in my mother's womb. And I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Sometimes we sit there and we wonder, oh, well, why did God create me? You know, I'm such a loser. I can't do this. Can't do that. God created you because you are special to him. You are marvelous. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are important. God wanted you here at this very time, at this very age for his good pleasure. There is no one, no one, absolutely no one that is conceived in a womb of a woman that God does not desire to be born. But sometimes things happen. Sometimes things happen. I had two brothers, I think it was two brothers that died before they were born. I had a sister that was born, lived nine days and passed away. Verse 15. Oh, wait a minute, uh, verse 14. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Marvelous are your, of your works, are your works, and that my soul knows very well. What is he saying there? He is saying, my soul knows that you wanted me to be conceived. My soul knows that you are the God, that you created me. My soul knows, and, and you know my soul. My frame is not hidden from you. My form, my formation, my creation, my, my growing in my mother's womb is known by you. God, the moment that child is conceived in that womb, God knows all there is. Matter of fact, he is the one that caused that conception. I was made in secret and skillfully wrought 
in the lowest parts of the earth. My eyes saw my substance, yet being unformed. And in your book, they all were written. And in your book, they were all written. In other words, as soon as that child is conceived, you may not even have named that child But God has already named that child and he knows the name of that child and he has written it in the book of life. That child is written down in God's book of life because God formed that child for his good pleasure. God knew everything that was going to, that it takes to form and to make that child before it was even formed. There is no mistakes by God. The days fashioned for me when I was yet, there were none of them. In other words, God has a plan for that baby from the very conception. He he knows exactly what he wants to happen with that baby for, for the rest of its eternal life. Before they were even before the baby was even born. How precious also are your thoughts to me, God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sands. When I awake, I am still with you. So before that child is even born, before it is even formed in the mother's womb, God has a plan for that child. And that child is written in the Lamb's book of life. If that child passes away, that scripture is telling us that child immediately goes and be with the Lord. Those three kids that my mom lost, they they were with God before she was there. They immediately went to be with the Lord. If you have ever had an abortion, uh, I hate to bring that up, but if you have ever had that and you wonder, well, how can I be forgiven for this? It is a forgivable sin. That baby didn't sin. And that baby is now with God. And when you get there, you will see that baby and you will know that baby. And that baby will know you. All who have passed before the measure of accountability will go to be with the Lord. Now, what does that mean, the measure of accountability? It's not a physical age. It's not seven. It's not eight. It's not nine. It's not 15. I have a son that's handicapped. He is 50 years old, believe it or not. He just turned 50 years old, January 29th, 1973. He loves the Lord, but he doesn't understand near what you and I understand. On some level, he's about six or seven years old. On other levels, if it comes to baseball, he's about 50 years old. I mean, he knows baseball, okay? Matter of fact, I'm taking him to a game tomorrow night. But my point is, is he has not and will never achieve that age of accountability because he cannot conceive and understand the things that you and I can understand. He has been baptized. He loves the Lord. He he knows the Lord in his heart. But better than that, the Lord knows him. And if something were to happen to him, heaven forbid, he would immediately go to be with the Lord. Whether he had ever been saved or not. Because he cannot obtain that age of accountability. So it's not a physical age. It's a mental aptitude. It's do you know good and evil? Do you know right from wrong? Do you know God? Do you not know God? God has made himself known to all of creation. Romans, uh, Romans 1 tells us. So it's not as though, oh, well, I've never been to church, so that's my excuse. That's not an excuse. My point being is that if you have ever lost a child in some way, shape, form, or fashion... Before that age of accountability, because after we attain that age of accountability, we are accountable. You are accountable for yourself. Your mom is no longer accountable for you. You are accountable for you. Before you reach that age of accountability, if something happens to you, you are with the Lord. That's the promises of God. 
So these children that you may have lost are waiting on you in heaven. They're there. They will know you and you will know them. Now what about the barren woman? Isaiah 54, Isaiah 54, verse 1 through 3. Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren, you have not born, who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who are, have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out to the curtains of your dwelling. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left. And your descendants shall inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabitable. What the scripture is saying there in the book of Isaiah to the prophet Isaiah. What he is saying is that you may not have been able to have children. But God has got plenty of them out there for you. There are orphans all over this world. There are kids who, uh, the little uh, six-year-old boy up in uh, Allen this last week, his mother, his father, and his, I think it was a three-year-old brother were all killed. This child is an orphan by himself. There are orphans all over the world that God has put and will put in your midst so that you can be a mother to them. That's what God does. He, have made, he has decided for some reason whatsoever that you would be a better mother to a thousand than a mother to two. So he says, sing and be proud of what I've given you. Even though you've never actually born a child. I would much rather have orphan kids than a child if I had to go through what y'all have to go through. No way. I'd rather have a thousand orphan kids. But I'm not made yet like y'all. Ladies, what an honor you have received from God. Though painful and sorrowful, and it will always follow you through motherhood. The very purpose of your being is to bring glory to God with your gift of motherhood. The giving of life. The very giving of life. So today, again, we honor you with a simple thank you. What else can we say? But thank you. Thank you for being the mom God has called you to be. Thank you. Amen. We glorify God with our praise, with our worship, with our lives, with our very lives. And ladies, I hope you understand. We thank you for all that you have gone through willingly and all that you will continue to go through. But the biggest calling that you have other than giving life itself is to help those children or help children through their life. And that's where the sorrow comes. That's where the hurt comes. That's where the stomping of your heart comes. Because we're just not headed kids. But you have given an opportunity to give life. You understand this far better than men do. You have given the honor been given the honor of producing life. Not something anything else or anybody else can do. Only you. And that life that you are able to give should be and hopefully will be dedicated to God. Now what is the best way to accomplish that? Is for you to be dedicated to God. Because we are to lead by example how many times have we said, don't do as I do, do as I say do? Does that work? Never. 
It does not work. So we, as Jesus tells us over in John 13, we are the example. You are the example to lead your family to the Lord. Will they wander astray? Yes, most likely. But scripture says, bring up a child in the ways of the Lord and he shall not depart from it. That means you bring that child up in the ways of the Lord and God's going to take a hold of him and he may wander a little while. I think we all have, but God will snatch him back at some point. Why? Because you have planted that seed. You have planted that seed. You don't make that seed grow. God makes that seed grow, but you have to plant it. And ladies, even though it is our responsibility too, it is your responsibility to rear those children. That's in scripture. It's not from me. Yes, guys, it's our responsibility too. Don't think it's not because we're responsible for the kids and our wives. But ladies, it is your responsibility to rear those kids in the ways of the Lord because that is what God has given you. And I pray you have done so or are doing so. Now you say, well, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure that I'm doing it right. Well, the best way to assure you're doing it correctly is to know the Lord and let him guide and direct your life. In order to guide and direct your life, you must have Christ. It's not a, well, I'll think of it someday or I'll come up with it someday. It's that you need to let God lead your life. Because God will never leave you astray. He'll never lie to you. He'll never misguide you. He'll always make your path straight. But you have to come to the Lord. And guys, the same thing with us. You're going to be responsible for your family. You're going to answer to God about it. And you're not going to know how to do it on your own. But with God, he will make your path straight as well. So if you do not know what to do, let's put it that way. The, the answer to the question is simply this. Call unto the Lord. Call unto the Lord. And he shall guide and direct your life. Lean not onto your own understanding, but lean on his. Lean on him. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. And he will make your paths straight. But if you don't have God, you're doing it yourself. Oh, well, it's my kid's fault. They did it. They decided to go do this. They decided to go do that. You are still held responsible. You're still held responsible. When you have them young. Now, once they attain that age of accountability, they're on their own. They have to make their own decisions. But they will make the right decision with a godly influence. They'll make the right decision with a godly influence. That has to come from you. It has to come from you. But if you don't have God, how are you going to do it? So today I pray that you will receive Christ if you have it. And let him guide you the rest of the days of your life. Let's pray. Father God, if anybody here today has not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, I ask you, Lord, to put it on their hearts. We're, we don't need to even try to do it on our own. We don't have to. You're always there. Your word says you never leave us nor forsake us. So you will guide us through all the trials and tribulation and testing that the world is going to throw at us. And when we've gone through those trials, tests, and tribulations, then we can come back and lead our children to where they hopefully won't go through the same trials, tests, and tribulations. And if they do, we can share with them that we know how to get through it. And the way to get through it is with God. In order to have God, you must have Jesus. If you do not have the Son, you do not have the Father. That's what the Scripture says. So if that's you today and you've not received Christ as Lord and Savior, I encourage you to do so. God makes it very, very simple, but you must mean it in your heart. Just say, Dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Guide and direct my path from this day forward. I want to see my children in heaven. 
And in order to do that, I must plant the seeds. So I need your, your word. I need you, Jesus, in my life. Guiding and directing my life for my kids' sake. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. And I will follow and abide in you from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.